Hi, everyone. Today, we are very happy to have John McGreevy from UCSD give us a talk about three manifolds and entanglement. Thanks so much for joining us, John. Looking forward to your talk. Yeah. Thanks, Nima. Thanks for having me. Um, so this is a talk uh, based on work with my postdoc, Bowen Shi, um, and my student, Jin Long Wong. Uh, and uh, we've, we've written up some of it in the form of this paper, which uh, ended up being a little bit long. Um, but part of the reason it's long is because we tried to have at least some parts that were, that were uh, readable by humans. Um, and, uh, and it's part of a larger program, which is called the Entanglement Bootstrap. So um, that's a, this is a, uh, I think it's a good name. For, for a program whose, whose goal is to try to understand uh, liquid topological orders in terms of two very reasonable axioms about a single ground state wave function. So let me explain a little bit about those words and what the, what the bigger picture is. Um, so by topological order, one, one way to, to say what I mean is um, a representative of a of a gap phase of matter, some non-trivial, some non-trivial gap phase of matter, which is distinguished from the trivial phase by uh, a stable ground state degeneracy that depends on the topology of space. So um, that, so okay, that's one way to think about it. Um, and uh, this is this is a stable situation because the these different ground states, say if you put them out, put the put the theory on a torus. Are related not by any local operator, but by some extended operators. And these extended operators you can think of as operators that, that transport topologically non-trivial particles around. So in two plus one dimensions, these particles are anions. And um, uh, so I said the word also liquid, I said liquid topological orders. And this word liquid is a sort of, uh, it's, a, it's an important simplifying assumption that the ground state degeneracy, I don't want it to depend on the geometry of the space, only on the topology. So this rules out fracton phases, which are which are beyond the scope of what I want to talk about. And uh, from a high energy point of view, you could, you could say you know, the, the subject is topological field theories. So um, a topological order uh, can be associated with a topological field theory with a few, a few extra assumptions. So the one assumption is that it's unitary. So there's some, you know, some nice interpretation in terms of the Hilbert space with, with a you know, positive inner product. And the other assumption is that it's, it's emergible. So this word emergible is a, uh, it's probably not in the dictionary yet, but um, the idea is that it's it's something that can arise as a description of some some phase of matter. So starting with some collection of so degrees of freedom coupled to each other with local interactions, um, the assumption is that you know this uh, such a theory can can arise as a low energy description. Um, exactly what that second constraint is on topological field theories is an interesting open question. Um, Okay, so so the, the the big picture motive questions that motivate this line of work are are the following. So, the entanglement bootstrap, as I'll review, has uh, had a lot of success already in the case of two plus one dimensions in, in in sort of deriving from from this very very austere starting point much of the algebraic theory of anions. So uh, you know this this theory of modular tensor categories. You know uh, it's often presented by mathematicians as its own subject, right? It has a, a collection of axioms from which a lot of the structure follows, the structure of you know, braiding matrices and uh, fusion rules and these things. Um, but actually, um, Bowen and his collaborators um, have, have shown that, that uh, well, essentially all of it that they've tried to, that they've been able to show so far uh, follows from, from this, this starting point. In, however, in three dimensions, in three plus one dimensions, um, the, the space of such things, the space of, of, of such topological orders is, uh, let, let's say it's, it's, it's less well understood. So there's, there isn't such a well-developed uh, algebraic theory. And it's much less clear that, that we know all possible labels on, on you know, ways in which such a theory can be interesting. Um, analogous to you know, what are the you know, statistics of the anions in, in, in two plus one dimensions. And uh, so although, although we, uh, you know, we have some good examples of, of topological orders in three one dimensions, as I'll, as I'll remind you, um, it's, it's much less clear that we understand, we understand the whole picture. And, um, and so it's, I think it's interesting to ask whether we can you know, develop you know, what is the right mathematical structure starting from these minimal assumptions. 
And then there's a second aspect, which is interesting in triples one dimensions, which is that three manifolds are, are interesting on their own. You know, unlike two manifolds, which are sort of, um, you know, labeled by just a, a single number, uh, namely the genus. And, uh, you know, so a topological phase of matter, you know, a state with intrinsical topological, topological order is a, is a probe of the topology of its, the space it lives on. You know, for example, it produces an integer, which is the number of ground states. Um, you know, that's the, the most bare bones invariant that it produces, and it certainly produces others. And uh, so it's interesting to ask how, how do data from 3D topological orders relate to, to known invariants of three manifolds, you know, which there's, you know, there's an enormous amount of work, but, you know, still, still ongoing. Um, okay, and so I have to say that, you know, there's lots of related work on these questions from other points of view, most of which take a sort of categorical approach, um, which, which I'm not going to say very much about, except that that categorical approach comes with certain uh, starting assumptions, some of which we'll be able to prove from, from this, from this you know, much simpler point of view. So that, that's one, one virtue of what we're doing. Okay, so, um, so a new perspective. Yeah, the entanglement bootstrap provides a sort of new perspective on these hard questions. So let me explain what it is. So like I said, it's a program to, to, to reconstruct the theory of topological order, starting from, from two simple axioms, which they're axioms about the structure of the entanglement in a single wave function on a, on a ball, say on a, on a totally trivial space, just like think of it as some region of, of some whatever larger manifold you're interested in. And um, the, the sort of central object of the entanglement bootstrap, I'll say what the axioms are in just a minute, but just to get a, good, a better idea of what the point of it is, the central object is, is a machine called the information convex set. And the information convex set associates to, to you know, given, a, given such a, a wave function satisfying these axioms, so that is given a topological order, and a region of space, which I'm calling X here, it associates a, a convex set, which is called sigma of X, which is a, a set of density matrices. And roughly, it's the set of density matrices on X that are, um, that look the same as the ground state on, on balls inside X. So, here, so here's an example in two dimensions. Here's a picture of X, it's an annulus. And on each of these balls, these little balls, we demand in order for a, a state row to be in the information in set, we demand that the reduced density matrix of rho on this ball and the reduced density matrix of the reference state on this ball agree. And so if it satisfies that on every one of these balls, then, uh, then it's declared an, an element of the information complex set. And uh, there, okay, this is a sort of slight, slight coarsening of the definition. Really, you have to enlarge X a little bit to account for balls that overlap the boundary, but okay, let's not worry about that. Um, and here's why this is an interesting thing. It's an interesting thing because of the following possibility. So one, a, def, a good definition of anions is excitations that can't be created by a local operator. So, you know, an anion in, is something where uh, there's some excitation, and necessarily it's always accompanied by another excitation somewhere else attached to it by some string, and a string, string where the operator acts non-trivially, the operator that creates this pair of anions. The string itself, however, you know, like a Dirac string, is, is invisible in the sense that there's no excitation in this region, but it necessarily, the operator necessarily has some support there. And so that means that if we're, if we're looking at states in this annulus, Although, you know, if, if compared to the ground state, if we act on the ground state with the, such an operator that creates an, an anion inside the annulus, because it's necessarily connected by this string operator to its partner outside the annulus, the density matrix in the annulus knows that there's an anion inside. It knows that there's a topological excitation inside. Despite the fact that if you only look at balls inside the region X, the, dense, the, the, the state is still indistinguishable from the ground state. And, uh, and so, so this means that the set, of, the set of density matrices consistent with the ground state on balls um, in, inside this region X knows, it, you know, it, it can tell whether, there, whether or not there's an anion inside and which type of anion it is. Okay, so, so that, that's, the, that's the, basic, the basic idea. And this, this object, this, inf this information convex set is a topological invariant in, in at least two senses. It's, a, it's an invariant under varying which ground state we use. So if I change the reference state 
to another state in the same phase of matter, then uh, the information convex set is, is the same. I'm, I'm going to mostly I, I will omit this label uh, psi because I'm just going to think about just a single reference state the whole time. Um, but that's so that's one way in which it's an, it's an invariant. And another way is it's in way in which it's an invariant is if I deform the, um, the the region to some other region of the same topology. So if I make some some uh, uh, yeah some 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 deformation of the region, uh, it preserves the information convex set. And when and when I say preserve the information convex set, you may think well convex set isn't that much structure was there to preserve. Um, what I, what I mean more specifically is that it preserves entropy differences. It so if I have you know consider two density matrices in this region and ask about what is the difference of their entropies, um, the, this, this isomorphism theorem uh, guarantees that their, that their images, the, the difference of entropies of the two images of those density matrices is, is preserved by this operation. Okay, so that's the, that's the, the central, central idea. Um, and so now I can, yeah, please. Uh, when it's an entropy difference of the two regions, so uh, you mean the entropy of a say a ball shaped region, and then the entropy of a same region translated around that annulus? Is that what you mean by delta s? No, no. I mean, I mean uh, the entropy of of some of two different states on the annulus. Ah, okay. Okay, thank you. And and entropy of two different states on this deformed deformed annulus. Okay. Yeah. So just the sense in which it's a topological invariant. And so now, okay, having said that, let me say what the axioms are. There, there are two very simple statements, um, which, which, are, which are, should, are, we demand that they hold in the reference state for, for arbitrary regions with, the, with this given topology. So there's two axioms. One is that for a ball contained inside an annulus, um, this combination of entropies should vanish. And the other one, that's called A0, and the other one is uh, for a ball contained in an annulus divided into two parts. This combination of entropies should vanish, and um, um, this is in in the reference state. And this, you know, we want this to hold for for uh, you know large enough regions uh, for any large enough regions of the given topology. And uh, one way to think about these axioms it, is the following: If it were true that the state satisfied an exact area law, in the sense that the entropy of a region were an area law term proportional to the bound, length of the boundary of the region minus uh, universal constant, this topological entanglement entropy gamma, then uh, these, these statements would be exactly true. They would follow just by you know, cancellations from the boundaries. So that's, that's, that's one way to, to motivate, their, uh, uh, motivate the two axioms. And uh, a way to think about how, the, how they're used is the following. So axiom A0 implies that the mutual information between C, the region in the, the region here that's buffered by B, and an arbitrary region outside this disk vanishes. And similarly, A1 says that C, the inside of this, this thing, with any region outside, uh, forms a Markov chain conditioned on B, forms a quantum Markov chain. So this conditional mutual information. Uh, between these three, three, these three regions, conditioned on this buffer region B vanishes. Um, so I, actually, I, I guess maybe I should ask, so uh, 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 maybe I should write down the definitions of these quantities. So by, by uh, I, uh, A with B, C comma B, conditioned on B, what I mean is SAB plus SBC minus SB minus SABC, right? And by mutual information, I mean, SA plus SC minus SAC, just to be clear. So, so, you know, so this, this statement says that- uh, Sorry, nice question. If mm -hmm. in the second axiom I put D like uh, reduced to zero, I don't get the first axiom. Sir, say it again. If, if in, the I, in the second axiom I reduce D to zero, don't, don't I get the first axiom? Oh, if, if you reduce D to zero. Uh, let's see, I guess, oh, you're saying by, by, by enlarging B. Yeah. Um, uh, I guess, like I guess that. maybe the, the only tricky part is that you have to change the topology of B when you do that. Right. Um, so I think, uh, in that sense, they're, they're independent of each other. Um, uh, and, okay. they, and they sort of have different consequences, right? So this, this one says that, uh, the, 
the mutual information. Well, okay. Um, okay, no, that's a, yeah, it's a fair question how independent they are. Um, uh, but yeah, everywhere I'm gonna assume, you know, I'm gonna assume that this is true for any region with this topology, any combination of regions with this topology. So uh, I'm a little nervous about shrinking B in the way you described, but I, um, but maybe Brilliant. it's possible. Yeah, okay, good. Um, all right, so, so uh, with, with the starting point, um, the, the first main result uh, in the 2D entanglement bootstrap, which is due to, due to these, these authors, um, is that the information comics study annulus is a simplex. So what I mean by a simplex is that, um, so it's a convex set where the extreme points are orthogonal to each other. So like a, like a tetrahedron. Um, and, uh, um, and we can associate those extreme points with, with anion types. So, um, so it's, it's basically as nice as it could be of an implementation of this picture I was, I was describing that the density matrix on this on this annulus can tell what kind of anion is inside of it, um, and if there are you know different anions produce yeah, produce orthogonal density matrices on the annulus, um, and then and then the next sort of familiar thing that we can define is uh, is the notion of the quantum dimension of that associated anion type, which is uh, which we can define as in, in terms of this difference of entropies. Um, of the density of the, the entropy of the extreme point minus the entropy of the reference state. So this, this row one is the, um, you can think of it as associated with the trivial anion. It's the case when the, the, the annulus is really globally equal to the reduced density matrix of the reference state. So, so that's, that's a, a way of extracting anion types from this very crude um, or austere set of information. And then we can ask about fusion of anions by considering a different region, namely this, this disk with two holes. So now we can label each of the holes of this disk by, by an anion type. And, and um, there's a new ingredient, which is that uh, this information comic set is not a simplex. I'll explain it in a little more detail uh, in, in a little bit, but it can be associated with, with vector space, with fusion spaces whose dimensions are, are um, labeled by the three anion types. And, um, there's a nice consistency check on the interpretation of this as fusion coefficients that this definition of the quantum dimension satisfies this, this usual, this rule, which, which uh, is uh, um, part of the algebraic theory of anions, um, this sort of relation between quantum dimensions and the fusion rules. Okay, and, and moreover, we can understand this topological entanglement entropy, which um, uh, I, well, I, one way in which it appears if we're given access to a, to, to a state satisfying the area law is here, but um, we can extract it from this uh, conditional mutual information of, of this combination of regions, and it's related to the total, total quantum dimension in this way. Okay, so that was a, a, you know, a very, very brief review of the, you know, it, how some of the 2D algebraic theory of anions comes from this, this framework. And now let me, let me focus on the three-dimensional version. Was there a question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In this like so that uh, at the very end you drew a different uh, setup, right? A, B, C mm -hmm. uh, for topological entanglement entropy. Is this related to the axioms that those those pictures above, or is it was it supposed to? Well, were we supposed to see a connection between the two, or? Well, okay, so yeah, it's it's a uh, there. There is a relationship to to the to the axioms, but it's it's um, it's important that this is a different uh, a different decomposition than of yeah of, than the ones appearing in the in the axiom. So this is a you know first of all it's a decomposition of the annulus, um, and uh, the um, and the axioms do not imply that this conditional mutual information is zero, um, and and so that means it's sort of a um, the fact that it's allowed to be non-zero means that it's some it's some invariant of the theory, which uh, um, by by uh, use, using the tools of the entanglement bootstrap, it can be shown to be re related to this total quantum dimension. I think. Um, yeah. So that so I should mention that this you know this this combination of entropies, uh, it was it was pointed out by Kataev and Preskill and Levin and Wen in two thousand five that it's uh, um, a useful invariant of a 
of a topological, a topological order that can be extracted from a single ground state wave function. Right. So in some sense, the, the whole program is a sort of continuation of, of the, this, this idea that they initiated of trying to extract all of the topological information from a single wave function. So this, you know, this combination is only, you know, a very coarse combination of, of invariants, right? It's just the total quantum dimension. Um, and so, you know, I feel like the entanglement bootstrap is, is a sort of elaboration of that program to, to get the rest of the information. Yeah, so yeah, thank you for the question. That's an, that's an important uh, contextual point. Okay, good. So now, so there, now we can, we can pose a version of the axioms in three dimensions. And actually the, it, it's, it's uh, surprisingly simple. The idea is a set of axioms which seems to work is to impose exactly the same two conditions. And the only difference between these pictures and the ones on the previous slide is that here I have this little arrow indicating that I'm speaking about the volumes of rotation that you get by taking this picture and uh, rotating it about, the, about this axis. So this is, so C is now a ball and B is a sphere shell surrounding it. And we demand that in the reference state, it satisfies again this condition. And C here is the ball and B and D are, are also balls, but that combine together to a sphere shell. Um, and the claim is that, that the basic results uh, starting from these 3D axioms generalize. So in particular, um, the information convex set of a region is still invariant under deformations of, of the region that don't change the topology or under deformations of the ground state. And, and so now we can ask the question, what generalizes the annulus as, a, as the thing that labels the topological excitations? And here we're met with a, a sort of embarrassment of riches because there, you know, there are many, many, many three manifolds and each of them can do something. So let's start with the simplest, simplest ones. So the most basic thing, the most basic analog of the annulus is the sphere shell. The idea being that a sphere shell can surround a point and, uh, and, and we can stick an annulus inside there connected by a string operator to its antiparticle outside the sphere shell. And so the, so the sphere shell, the information coming out of the sphere shell detects particle excitations. Um, a new thing that can happen is that there can be excitations supported on loops. So here I've drawn a, so the red is always where the excitation is. And this shaded in thing is, is the analog of the string operator. It's a, it's a membrane operator, which itself doesn't excite the system, but when it has a boundary, it excites the system. And so such an such a excitation, which is supported on a loop, is detected by the information convex set of a solid torus, right? So this solid torus here, is uh, you know it, it intersects the membrane operator but not the excitation, and so the dense the reduced density measures on the solid torus knows about this this alpha knows about the label of this excitation type. Um, okay, and then one small further generalization is we can consider instead a torus shell. A torus shell can, now can have several kinds of excitations involved. It can have the same kind of loop excitation. Which which uh, links one cycle of the torus, but they, and it can also have an excitation inside it along the longitudinal curve, and then there can also be particle excitations attached to each of them, um, and so this this we'll call a general loop excitation or a hop excitation. Hop excitation since the two these two loops form a hop. So, but these are these are just the, the first three possibilities, and there in fact there are others that we'll we'll talk about. Um, okay, so I should I should give an example. Uh, to, to focus our attention. So the, the key example that we'll, with which I'll illustrate the statements that we'll make is just 3D gauge theory based on a, on a, on a, fin on a finite group G. And um, a nice solvable model, so a, a special point in the phase diagram of 3D gauge theory is realized by this uh, th quantum double model built by Kataev, whose Hilbert space is built by, on each link, there's a, there's a Hilbert space labeled by group elements elements of G. And the Hamiltonian has two kinds of terms. Um, like in the Torah code, there's, there's a star term, this A thing, and, and there's a plaquette term, this B thing. And, and uh, in, in the language of gauge theory, the role of A is to, is to impose the Gauss law constraint. So you see this Hamiltonian is minimized when, uh, when A is equal to one. And so when A equals one, the state satisfies the Gauss law constraint, which is this at each vertex we multiply uh, we conjugate the, the attached links. 
And the, similarly, energy is minimized when B is equal to one and A and B commute so that that's actually the ground state. Um, and B is the operator that threads flux. Well, actually, it makes sure that there's zero flux through the plaque at P. Um, okay, so this is a nice Hamiltonian description of discrete gauge theory, um, which is, which is a, you know, solve, in a solvable limit. And um, in this theory, the, the particle excitations are labeled by irreducible representations of G. Um, the, this is what's detected by the sphere shell. And um, uh, the quantum dimension is just the dimension of the represent, representation. And the total quantum dimension is, is just the order of the group. And the loop excitations are, are associated with fixes. So, so this is just some, some flux line. And they're labeled by conjugacy classes of G. Their, their quantum dimension is just the number of square to the number of elements of the conjugacy class. Z here is the centralizer. And, uh, and the total quantum dimension of, of the fluxes is also the order of the group, right? It's a familiar fact that you know, the sum of the representation dimensions of the representation squared uh, is the order of the group. And so is the, well, every element is in a conjugacy class. Um, and, and the crucial idea for, for showing that this is the case, um, meaning showing that the information convex set of the sphere shell counts these guys and the information convex set of the solid torus counts these guys is this notion of a minimal diagram, which it's, it's essentially a consequence of the, um, of the normalization group. Namely, this, this model is a sort of uh, represents a, a, a fixed point of the normalization group, a zero correlation like fixed point of the normalization group where we can for free we can add uh, links and plaquettes and or better, we can remove them in order to simplify the lattice. And so we can study the, the model on the, the simplest possible uh, discretization of each of these regions. So with just like one or two edges and, and it, makes it, it makes it very easy to, uh, to derive, well, it makes it easier to derive these statements. Okay, so that's, a, that's an example. And, and we'll illustrate, I'll illustrate various statements with this example as we go. Um, Oh, and I guess I should say, if, if, if the group G is, is abelian, then this reduces to the, the toric code. Um, in the non-abelian case, it's a little more interesting because you can see that these, uh, these dimensions don't need to be one, for example. And these, yeah, these dimensions don't need to be one. Um, okay, so, so now I have to, I have to explain a, a very important dichotomy uh, in the form of the information convex set, which depends on the, the topology of the region X. So there, there are essentially two kinds of, of X for this purpose. And they're associated with, with two kinds of data, one, um, I, which, which we could call classical or coherent. So the simpler case is for some regions X, which can be called sectorizable. I'll say what that means in a second. Um, the, the, the information convex set is a simplex, meaning that all the extreme points are orthogonal with respect to this uh, trace inner product. And, um, and that means that the extreme, point, extreme points can be associated with independent excitations. And this is really classical information in the sense, it's classical in the sense that it can be copied. So for example, this, is, this property is, is um, the annulus satisfies this property. And one way to think about copying it is if you break up the annulus into, into two pieces, like a left piece and a right piece, each of them knows about the anion type of the anion inside. So in that sense, the information in the density matrix, uh, you, you could copy it from you know from the from the left region to the right region. So, and that, that's what I mean when I say that it's classical information in the sense that quantum information cannot be copied. Um, the co in contrast, the alternative to this um, is the case where the information convex set is associated with some with a fusion space. And so here, so to explain what I mean by that, let me let me uh, explain this this structure theorem. Which, uh, for which actually a general proof was given uh, by these folks. And the statement is that uh, the information convex set of an arbitrary region is a, is a convex combination of a collection of small sets labeled by A. And what is A? Um, a labels extreme points of the thickened boundary of the region. So here, suppose the region is this omega. The thickened boundary is this, is this region. And it's a, it's a slightly non-trivial fact that the thickened boundary of a region is always sectorizable. Namely, the information convex set of the thickened boundary is always a simplex. And so that means that its labels, it's, it, you know, it can, a state there can be just labeled by, but it's just a convex combination of its extreme points. And, uh, and so we can, 
we can decompose the full density matrix in this way. And so by this you know, plus here, this is a non-standard notation. I just mean plus of convex sets means convex combinations of elements of each of them. Um, and so then the interesting ingredient is, is that if I fix the state of the boundary, so let's think about sigma A, which means the subset of the information convex set where the boundary is in state A, it, it's the state space of a Hilbert space. So meaning it's the space of density matrix on some Hilbert space HA, and the dimension of that Hilbert space it, it is some integer, some positive integer, which is, it's an invariant of, of the data. It's an invariant of the state of matter, and it's an, it's an invariant of, of the region, of the topology of the region. So, so uh, um, I guess I, maybe I should say, what, what is this sectorizable condition? So uh, a region, yes, yeah, so this, is, this is a useful definition. Um, uh, a region R is sectorizable uh, if um, it's if it contains two disjoint regions, if it's a disjoint union of two, oh, it contains a disjoint union of two regions with uh, where each of them can be deformed to the whole region. So, for example, for the annulus, um, you know, it contains this annulus, and then it also contains this annulus. Um, so the claim is that this is a this is a um, if a region if a region is sectorizable, then its information convex set is a, is a simplex. So if a region is not sectorizable, there's room for it to be more interesting. Then, in particular, there can be a non-trivial uh, fusion space. Okay. So, for example, an example of a non-sectorizable region is this uh, is the two hole and is the two hole disk in two dimensions or the ball minus two balls in three dimensions, and they play a similar role. So namely, the information convex set of this thing can be decomposed into uh, this convex combination of sectors labeled by the boundary types. So here are the boundary types, each of them is a sphere shell labeled by a particle, particle type. And then each of these sigma ABCs is, uh, um, is the state space of some, some Hilbert space whose dimension uh, is the fusion multiplicity. So in the case of the quantum double, these particle excitations are ir irreducible representations of the group. And uh, these integers are the structural constants of the fusion ring of the irreducible representations. So I mean, if you tensor the two representations, you can decompose it as a, as a direct sum of, of irreps with, and this is the number of times that irrep C appears in the tensor product of A and B. Okay, so that's that in the, in the quantum double example, that's what this is. More generally, this is some you know abstract uh, Hilbert space. Okay, so let me let me illustrate the 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 you know kind of technique that's involved in the entanglement bootstrap uh, with with a you know a simple statement, which is which is uh, the statement that the total quantum dimension that we get from the particles, the sum of the quantum squares of the quantum dimensions of the particle types, is always the same as the total quantum dimension we get from the flux loops. So in the case of the quantum double, both of these were just equal to the order of the group. But this fact, this fact is actually completely, completely general. And uh, the main reason I wanted to do this was to introduce this, this key tool, which is called merging. And so the idea is that starting with a density matrix in, in AB, some region AB, at, in the information convex set of AB, and another, another density matrix in the information convex set of BC, if they agree on B, then they can be they can be merged into a state in the information convex set of ABC, and so and moreover, so that that state has some nice properties. In particular, it's a quantum Markov chain on ABC, and uh, and moreover, the that result is the maximum entropy state on a, on ABC consistent with the with the given marginals, um, and moreover, the merging pr process preserves uh, uh, preserves entropy differences. Um, so this is a you know, very powerful tool, and so one you know to illustrate it, let's let's think about um, decomposing the solid torus by building it from two balls. So here's here's a ball that I've sort of stretched, and another ball that I've sort of stretched, and so so in the in the merging theorem, so the the roles of A B and and B C 
are, are played by by this decomposition. And so by mushing these things together, we can we can make a solid torus. And then the merging theorem says that the resulting density matrix, starting with well, okay, starting with there's a unique state of the ball, so there's no choice here. Starting with that unique state of the ball, the merge state is the maximum entropy state on the solid torus, which takes this form just by because we know the form of the states on the solid torus, and we can we can maximize their entropy. Um, and moreover, because of the merging theorem, the result is a quantum Markov chain, and we can write this this conditional conditional mutual information in terms of these uh, these these quantum dimensions and an analog of the topological entanglement entropy. So this topological entanglement entropy it's the analog of, it's one analog of that that picture I drew in two dimensions. So this is one way to decompose the the solid. You know, it's a way to decompose the solid torus analogous to that kataya preskill decomposition of the annulus. But similarly, we can do the same thing to make a sphere shell from two balls. So here's, you know, take a ball and then poke a, poke a little indentation in it, take another ball and poke an indentation in it, and then join them together so that there's a hole in the metal, right? In this way, we make a sphere shell. And the same logic says that the resulting state is the maximum entropy state on the sphere shell. So now these, this sum is labeled by particle excitations rather than flux fluxes. And the same logic says that we can, because this conditional mutual information vanishes, we can relate the, the total quantum dimension to this, to another analog of the topological entanglement entropy, which now is a decomposition of the, sol of the sphere shell rather than of the solid torus. And then finally, with some clever application of strong subadditivity and the axioms, we can show that these two topological entanglement entropies are actually the same. And so from that, we conclude that this total quantum dimension is equal to this total quantum dimension. Okay, so that's that's a, an illustration of the technique. Yes, new, great. Uh, just, uh, I'm a little bit confused. I got lost in the merging part. So uh, the the states in sigma a b and sigma b c, the reduced sensing matrices do not need not commute, right? Um, so we're we're given one. Oh, in general they, they don't, but we're given one of them here and one of them here. Yeah, so they need not commute, uh, which means that this problem of, you know, like, uh, so it's not, if, if you look at the, all the, these row stars, right, belonging to sigma ABC that are consistent with these marginals, and you want to find the one that has max entropy, this is a non-trivial minimization, uh, maximization problem. Um, in, in general, yes. In, in general, that's absolutely true. Here, it's actually, it's actually, it, here it's pretty simple though because the region the region B here is just a ball, and there's a unique state in the information copy set of the ball. I guess I should have said that. Um, and so so that there's there's no choice to be made about about that marginal. Um, if if we were merging some more complicated things which had like lots of handles and stuff, so that there are many states in the information copy set, then you're totally right that the Finding the maximum ent maximum entropy state consistent with those marginals is is not an easy thing, but in this case it's easy. Yeah, because I, maybe I should emphasize I'm not talking. We're not merging just like arbitrary density matrices on these regions. We're we're merging very special density matrices that are elements of the information convex set of those regions, meaning that they you know locally satisfy these conditions. That, that yeah, I, I'm just wondering that this is very special. This is super special, and this is a structure that you're uh, that these guys pointed out. That is unique to this topological series, I guess. Well, even I mean, even even with that assumption, if we were merging more complicated things, the finding the the maximum entropy state consistent with the marginals is is, is not always is not trivial. Yeah, for sure, for sure, it's highly not trivial. Yeah, but in in this case, we can do it. Yeah, I see. Yeah, good question. Um, all right, great. So. Okay, so that was that was a sort of introduction to the entanglement bootstrap in 2D and 3D. And now let me let me try to explain some 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 things that we can do with it. Um, so I want to I want to start by talking about this this notion of braiding non-degeneracy. Um, so what is what do I mean by braiding non-degeneracy? This is this is something which which is an axiom in the, the categorical approach to the subject. So the idea is simply that every anion worth its salt should breed non-trivially with something else, because otherwise it wouldn't be an anion, right? Otherwise, otherwise it would just be some local excitation. Uh, it's sometimes called the remote detectability condition. Um, so for example, a particle in three plus one dimensions 
uh, had better have some non-trivial braiding with a with a loop, right? Some you know, this is oops, sorry. This is a picture of you know, here's a here's a loop excitation alpha, and I I braid this this particle excitation a around around that loop, um, and I should you know I should pick up some there should be some alpha for which I pick up some non-trivial phase. Um, and a simple illustration of this in the in the case of the 3D quantum double is that the particle types are labeled by ear reps of G, and the loop excitations are labeled by conjugacy classes of G. And famously, these two, the number of these is equal. And so that says that there, there's room to have a square matrix, a square matrix encoding the braiding of these excitations, um, which is called the S matrix. Um, and uh, OK, so we can prove that with a certain implementation of this S matrix, um, that it's in fact not only square, but unitary. That it's, it's uh, yeah, not, not non-degenerate. It can be normalized so that it's a unitary matrix. And one way to define this S matrix is to start with an extreme point of the solid torus. So I'll call that row alpha that's labeled by a loop excitation type. And so the whole story will take place in the solid torus that I draw here. And then consider an operator WA, which, uh, which transports a particle type around the non-trivial cycle of that solid torus. And just take the trace of the product of those two operators. So it's just essentially the expectation value of that loop operator in the state given by this, this uh, extreme point on the solid torus. Uh, and then there's some normalization factors to make it unitary. Um, and so, yeah, so we. We can, I'll, I'll say a little bit about the proof of, of, of why this is unitary in just a minute, but, but actually we can say more, which is that this matrix satisfies a Verlinde formula. So namely, there's a relationship between a bunch of copies of this matrix that I just defined and the fusion multiplicities. So exactly of the same form as, as the Verlinde formula for, you know, which is satisfied by the S matrix in, in, in rational CFTs in, in, in one plus one dimensions, or by the S matrix of, of uh, anions in, in two plus one dimensions. Um, and a, a difference from the 2D case is that in two dimensions, the, the S matrix is a, is a matrix relating anions and anions. So the two indices on the S matrix are of the same kind. Here, the two indices on the matrix are different, right? One of them is a particle excitation, the other is a flux loop. And so actually there's a second independent Verlinde formula that's also true, where instead of summing over the flux type, we sum over the particle type and we get uh, some fusion coefficients associated with fluxes. In, the case, in this case, actually, we can prove that this number is, is, the, is the fusion multiplicity of the ball minus two balls and is therefore an integer within the entanglement bootstrap. We actually don't have a similar interpretation of this number, um, though it, it does turn out to be an integer in the examples we've studied. Um, a consequence, a sort of more far-reaching consequence of this statement, because of the fact that um, the, um, you know, this means that the S matrix determines the fusion multiplicities, um, and, and as I think probably vice versa, um, is that the part if the particles are labeled by the irreps of some finite group as they are in the quantum double and also in in various generalizations like the twisted quantum double, which some people have conjectured exhaust the possibilities of topological order in three dimensions, it means that the pure fluxes are also labeled by conjugate classes of the group, be essentially because there has to be a, this this unitary pairing between the two. Um, okay, so so let me say a little bit about the quantum double example just to, to, make it, to make this more concrete. Because in this case, we can explicitly compute this S matrix. So a minimal diagram for the solid torus, well, it's not quite the most minimal, but it's an almost minimal diagram, has just two vertices and two links. So it's like the simplest lattice model you could ever think of, and no faces at all. And the operator W that transports a particle of type A, so just, just channel your understanding of lattice gauge theory. Um, it's just the product of, on each link, so G1 and 2 label the two links here. On each link, it's just the representation matrix, IJ, that transports the particle of type A from, from I to J across the link. And this one transports the particle of type A from J to I across the other link. And so you see these, these matrix indices are summed and it becomes a trace. It's a trace of the product of two representation matrices, which is just 
the trace of the representation matrix of the product, and which is just the character. So, so this is the operator that, that transports an anion around a loop in the quantum bubble model. And an expression for an extreme point on the solid torus has this very simple form. You just sum over elements in a, you pick a conscious class and sum over the elements in that conscious class in such a way that the product of the group elements is equal to that, to that element. Okay, so this, so just, this is a very explicit expressions for the two ingredients in the S matrix. And so then if we compute the S matrix, it's just equal to the character table up to normalization. So, you know, unsurprisingly, the character table is the, is the pairing between irreps and conjugacy classes, which in this case is particles and loops. Um, so actually the proof, the proof that we'll give of the unitarity of the S matrix give, gives a, a, a proof by topology of the orthogonal, orthogonality relations for the characters of a finite group. It's uh, yeah, maybe, maybe the least, least practical proof of that, of that statement. Um, that, that's a little bit of a joke. Um, yeah, okay, that, this is not the most important application. Um, and uh, okay, and so I guess, I guess maybe I already said this, that the NABCs are in this case are, are just the, you know, the, the ring of fusion of irreducible representations and the N alpha beta gamma come from the algebra of classes. And so, and indeed, the, the, you can prove the Verlinde formula for this fact, for these objects uh, without too much trouble. In a, in a more elementary way. Um, okay, so here's the idea of this non-degeneracy proof, um, which 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 involves a what I think is a really beautiful ingredient. So the first the first the first step is pretty simple. The idea is to so it's to prove this this sort of auxiliary statement, which itself relates the S the S matrix and the fusion rules, and the idea is to consider the product of two operators. That transport an anion type A and an anion type B around the solid torus. So we're you know sort of doing them at the same time, and we think of that in two ways. So the first way we think about it is um, well, we just the a state on the torus can be factorized into a like the state of the inside of the torus and the state of the outside of the torus. We can sort of copy the information about the state of the of the solid torus, and so this just this is just equal to the product of these two S matrices. On the other hand, we could instead first fuse these guys together into, an, into a single anion of type C, in which case the, we get a formula proportional to these fusion, this fusion coefficient. Um, so, that's, so that's where the, the fusion coefficients come in. But then the second part is, is the part where we really prove the, the non-degeneracy is, is to show that um, the essentially, if we start in the maximum entropy state on the solid torus and, and uh, compute the expectation value of this operator that transports the anions, we only get something non zero if we transport the trivial anion. Um, and, uh, um, and so from this, the Verlinde formula follows. And the idea for this, the idea of this proof um, is, uh, involves, involves an interesting new ingredient. And the interesting new ingredient is is uh, is the following? So start with with this part of the solid torus, and then it's missing a little chunk here, and the little chunk there is made up with this uh, by part of this sphere shell. And so on this region B here, where they overlap, we 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 that's that's the region that's the region that they overlap. But there's another place where if you just drew this in three dimensions, they would touch each other. But we regard that as as two different regions. So we, they don't touch there. They imagine they, you know, it moves off into another dimension on this locus. And so if we merge a state, uh, you know, each of these is a ball. So if we merge the only state of the information copy set of ABC, that's this part of a sphere shell with, okay, sorry. This is, ABC is a sphere shell, but we choose the, the reference state. C, CD is a, is a ball. So there's only, there's only one state. And if we merge these, we get a state on ABCD, um, which is the, the maximum entropy state on, on, on ABCD. And uh, um, well, anyway, play, playing around with the support of these, these string operators, um, we, we can use the, the, the form of this, of this state on ABCD to, to prove this fact. I don't want to go into details, but I, I do want to highlight the importance of the 
resulting region. The resulting region is, is this thing, which is, it's not embedded in, in, in R3 or in, in S3. Because, so you see, you know, um, this, this locus here appears twice in the region, you know, once on one sheet and once on the other sheet. And this region ABCD is actually homeomorphic to S2 times S1 minus a ball. It has a, just a single component of the boundary. And if you fill in that single component of the boundary with a, with a ball, what's left is S2 times S1. And so the interesting thing is that it's not a subregion of R3. We could say that it's immersed rather than embedded, right? So, you know, so, something, something is embedded if it, you know, it doesn't intersect itself at all. And immersed means it's allowed to intersect itself, but you, you know, count it as, as uh, um, um, but you can, anyway, in, in differential topology, uh, it's defined in terms of the properties of the tangent space. Here, instead, we just define it in terms of the properties of the, of the density matrices, right? So we regard, you know, there's like two copies of the Hilbert space on this region, which are, which are sort of independent. And okay, so I make a big deal about this because we can show that many of the entitlement bootstrap results go through for immersed regions. And in particular, there's a generalized isomorphism theorem that two information convex sets of two regions are, are isomorphic if you can deform them not just through embeddings, but also through immersions. And so one, one important consequence of this is that we can study non-trivial you know, uh, ground states on non-trivial non spaces, non-trivial topology, just starting from the wave function on a ball. All right, so here we've, we've made a ground state S2 times S1 minus a ball that we can fill in actually. So essentially S2 times S1, just starting from the wave function on a ball. Um, okay, so that's, this, this translation would be a very useful tool. All right, so, so uh, in the quantum double model, we've just, we've just you know, the, the braiding between particles and fluxes is the character table. And similarly, the Verlinian formula implies that the fusion uh, of particles and pure fluxes is also determined by the character table. But of course, a character table doesn't determine the group, right? There are groups that have the same character table, which are nevertheless distinct, like D4 and Q8. The distinction between them is the, is the order of various elements are different. Um, and so we can ask, well, is there an entanglement bootstrap observable that distinguishes between these? And, uh, and there is, and it turns out to be very useful for other purposes. Um, and the idea is that a solid torus contains many other solid tori. So here's, here's a picture of, uh, so imagine, you know, take the surface, the volume of revolution starting from this disk, it sweeps out a solid torus. If I take the volume revolution of these two red dots, but as I, as I go around this way, I also rotate in the uh, azimuthal direction, I get, you know, it sweeps out this picture. So this red thing is also a solid torus. It's a solid torus inside the original solid torus. And so we can define a map from the extreme points, sorry, from this information coming set of the solid torus to itself by the following sequence of operations. So first, you take a state of the big solid torus, then you trace out everything but this spiral solid torus, and then you deform it along some fixed path back to a larger, back to the original solid torus. And the claim is that this, this, uh, this map takes extreme points to extreme points of the information convex set. And it's something that you could compose. And, it, you know, so n is the number of times you wind it around. So here's the case of two, here's the case of three. If we compose the one with n and the one with m, we get the one with n times m. And I mentioned this here because in the case of the quantum double, it simply, it measures exactly the order of subgroups. So it takes a, a representative of a conjugacy class and maps it to the nth power of that representative, which is a way to, indeed a way to distinguish D4 and Q8. Um, so uh, a conjecture is that if, is that there's always, that the total quantum dimension is always an integer. And if you do the spiral map with that order, it takes everybody to the trivial element. So the idea, the idea is that, um, and so this is of course true for, for the quantum double where the, the total quantum dimension is related to the order of the group. If you raise any, any group element to the power of the order of the group, you get the identity. Um, and we can prove it for abelian topological orders, namely ones where all, to, all the quantum dimensions are one. But more generally, this, you know, this would be a generalization of Legendre's theorem. Legendre's theorem is that this is true for the quantum double model. And we, have, we haven't proved this yet, um, but one thing we did prove is that it's monotonic. So in particular, the quantum dimension 
of a flux is always bigger than the quantum dimension of its image under the spiral map. So this is a, you know, how to say, a weak, this, is, this statement is implied by this statement, but uh, yeah, so this is, it's, it's yeah, an interesting con conjecture, which would be a, you know, a topological field theory generalization of Legendre's theorem. Okay, so I had just a couple more things to say. Um, the first is that uh, there's, a, there's a large set of other excitations in, in three dimensions. I guess that's actually the main, the main thing I have to say. One of which are, the, are these graph excitations. So this is, you know, the red thing is where the excitation is and the, the shaded part is where the, the support of the operator that creates it. And one way to think about this is you can fuse these two, these two fluxes in such a way in, along, this, along this curve to produce one of these graph excitations. And these are detected by the information convex set of a, a genus G handlebar. So this, uh, if you take a, take a genus two Riemann surface and fill in the inside of it, that's a genus two handle body. And it, it, that's what detects these graph excitations. And it's also a simplex, the genus, genus G handle body is a, is a sectorizable region. And in the case of the quantum double model, the number of such extreme points is determined by the size of the centralizers of the, of the group elements. Um, and I mentioned this because in the case of the S3 quantum double, the, the genus two excitations come with 11 excitation types. Whereas the flux sectors just come in three types because there's three conjugate classes of S3. And so you see these graph excitations are not just take two, two loops and put them on top of each other. There's more, there's more of these than there are of loops on top of each other. So these are they really are independent excitations. And uh, they also satisfy this remote detectability. They satisfy, uh, um, they have a, a unitary S matrix with, uh, um, excitations which are made by taking a part, taking three particles created by the same operator. Um, okay, I'm not gonna say too much more about that, except to say that um, our understanding of this non-degeneracy of the S matrix of the graph excitations, again, involves an immersed region, which uh, that immersed region is, you take, take the ball minus two balls and glue to it this Genus G, genus G handle body. So you see this BC is a genus two handle body and ABC and A and the, and the, sorry, BC and this ball minus two balls share this red region. And the combined region is actually a connected sum of a bunch of copies of S2 times S1, all minus the ball. Um, so this, yeah, so this, this region is called the pairing region and it's the, it's the star of the, of the proof of the unitarity of that S matrix. Okay, I'm gonna skip this. This is just an illustration of the squareness of the S matrix in the case of the quantum double model. Um, okay, so the last thing I wanna talk about is, uh, is knots. So when I talk about a knot, what I mean is a, a neighborhood of the knot. So you know, just imagine thickening it a little bit. And of course, there's a, a long history of, of knot theory. And the basic question is, you know, given two knots, can they be deformed into each other? And uh, a complete answer to that question is the fundamental group of the knot complement. Um, and uh, this, so this is great in the sense that it is a way to answer this question, but the fundamental group of the knot complement is in general, some horrible infinite group of which we're given just some presentation. And it's very hard to tell when two of them are the same. And so in practice, the way people study this is by considering representations of that knot group, this GK is called the knot group, into some finite group, which here I call gamma. And uh, this, uh, this point of view is what leads to most of the familiar knot invariants, like, like such as three coloring of knots can be, can be thought of as classifying representations of the knot group in S3. Um, and uh, there's a, I, I guess, an important uh, construction of the knot group is called the Vertinger presentation, where arcs, you know, draw the knot on the plane like, like this picture, and arcs of the knot are associated with generators of the, of the knot group, and crossings are associated with relations. Right? So this gives the explicit presentation of the knot group if you can draw the knot like this. Um, okay, and, and uh, you know, there's a lot of previous work on this idea of thinking about representations of, of the knot group. Um, and in fact, there are even previous connections to gauge theory where people regard 
uh, the representation as arising from a flat connection on, on the knot complement and thinking of it as a critical point of the Trent-Simons functional and then doing Morse theory using the Trent-Simons functional. Um, and you know, that's led to some, some wonderful things. Um, but here we're gonna think about a slightly different thing. Um, so, okay, so let me, you know, the, okay, the point of this slide, I already, I already introduced this, uh, the quantum double model, a special case of it when the group is abelian is, is the toric code. And, you know, a good way to think about the toric code, as you know, if you're taking Nima's class, um, is that its ground states know about the homology of the manifold, right? Um, so in particular, the ground states are labeled by, by closed loops um, for the one form toric code. And uh, um, yeah, so that's the point of it. It detect, it, it's grounds to detect the homology. Um, the quantum double, in contrast, uh, detects the, the first fundamental group. It detects homotopy. And uh, you know, so the, this condition, the star condition, demands that the ground state is associated with closed loops. And the Plaquet condition, you can think of as imposing uh, the homotopy equivalence relation. And, and so, you know, the fact that the, homo the first homology is the realization of, of, the, of the first homotopy group says that you know, the quantum double in the non-abelian case gives you more information. Um, so, okay, so my point in saying, saying this is that you know, what I just said is that ground states of the quantum double with a finite group on the knot complement uh, are, is associated with representations of the knot group, right? That's exactly, that's exactly what it is. Um, but suppose instead of just thinking about the ground state on the knot complement with some gap boundary conditions on the boundary, suppose instead we just think we think about the information convex set of the knot complement. Um, so it's it's clearly some generalization of, of this. It's something something for something beyond uh, just a representation of the knot group. And uh, okay, so so this generalized isomorphism theorem that I mentioned says that the information uh, convex set of the knot itself is the same for as the unknot. Right. The knot itself doesn't have an in interesting information complex set, but the complement is the interesting thing, the information complex set of the knot complement. In particular, it encodes a fusion space, which we can think of as the ways to create from the vacuum the loop excitation in the shape of the knot, along with some possible particle excitations, which I'm going to call a knot multiplicity. And so the, the membrane operator that creates such an excitation is a Seifert surface for the knot. So, so here's this red thing is the knot, the orange thing is the Seifert surface. It's just a, you know, a way of filling in. It's a surface whose boundary is the knot. Um, and the, this information convex set is a knot invariant. It's, you know, it's, it's like an example of categorification of invariants. We have invariants which are integers and you interpret it as the dimension of some Hilbert space. Except here, we're doing the same thing, but without, with mixed states rather than pure states. Um, so, okay, so we've been uh, computing this information convex set of not complements for various, you know, in the quantum double model, for example, for various knots and links and, and spatial graphs using this minimal diagram technique. And essentially the, the punchline of that calculation is that the demand of the state being in the information complex set imposes the work relations of the knot group. But the resulting thing is not a representation of the knot group because it's a collection of density matrices. So it's something more general that I don't exactly know what to call it. Um, and a surprising discovery is that these not multiplicities can be non-trivial, which means that it, an excitation shaped as a knot can store quantum information in the same way that like a pair of anions can, can store quantum information, which you can then braid by rotating them around each other. Here, I don't actually don't know how to, don't know how to act on that quantum information. Um, and, and then maybe the most important thing we did was to prove a collection of consistency conditions on these fusion multiplicities and on the quantum dimensions of the knot excitations essentially using this merging technique. So one, one, uh, one important consequence of that is we can bound from above the fusion multiplicities of, of torus knots. So a torus knot is a, is a knot that you can draw on the surface of a, of a torus and bend it in, in through space. Um, okay, so I've gone, I've gone over time. So let me, let me just conclude. Um, you know, I, the thing I found so exciting about this is that you know, any three manifold with boundary has a role to play in this discussion. So like the sphere shell, so the, the ball doesn't do much. The sphere shell classifies particles, the torus, solid torus classifies pure fluxes. Um, regions that are not sectorizable labeled fusion multiplicities. Um, and, and we've seen some examples of pairings between two different 
types of excitations, and therefore two different types of two different topologies of three manifolds. So such as the solid torus is paired with the sphere shell, um, and the genus N solid is paired with the ball minus N balls, and the ball minus the solid torus is paired with itself, and you know various other examples that I didn't mention. I don't know how to complete this list for arbitrary three manifolds, and whether there is such a pairing between three manifolds. Um, it would be interesting to decide that question. And finally, in two dimensions, this the analog of these associativity relations, these consistency conditions that we proved, allow us to reduce all of the data down to just essentially just the annulus and the two-hole disk that contains all of the data. Um, in three dimensions, we don't know the analogous minimal set of data that we need, you know, or do we actually need to check the information coming set of every possible three out of them in order to decide whether two topological orders are the same. So that's an important open question that I don't know how to answer yet. Um, okay, thanks for listening. There are lots of lots of other things I don't know, but yeah, maybe you guys can tell me more of things that I don't know. <laughs> Are there questions for John here or online? I have a naive question. So the example you gave us was like um, you. So the the region the exam in, in the examples the regions are like separated like it's 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 uh, right next to each other. Do you have any um, examples with like overlapping regions? Is it possible to consider that by any case? So if you have, um, yeah, so if you think of topological space and think of two regions that is overlapping, is it an extensible thing to consider or? Well, in, in this merging process, it's important that they overlap, right? So let me, let me go back to this definition oh, of the merging okay. process. Yeah, um, yeah so it, it's important that they overlap and. But moreover, that they agree on the overlap. Um, so, right, so we're merging a state in AB and a state in BC. And the assumption is that they, the reduced density matrix on B is the same for the two of them. So, so I think that's, that's, that seems to be what you're asking for, right? We have, we have two regions that, that share some overlap. And in that case, and, and in that case we, can, we can merge the density matrices to make a state on the whole system. Okay, okay. Thank you. And I have one more basic question. Please. So, the density matrix you are associating is a subregion of topological space, right? So subsets, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. So, yeah, yeah. so these uh, subsets, like op open subsets, that you're considering. Um, so, is that, is that true? So, when you say open, I guess I mean it's true that it, right. It's we get a we get a mixed state on the on this on the subset. If that's what you mean by open, or maybe you mean. If you well, mean something about what I'm doing with the boundary, then I'm not, I don't know. Yeah, yeah about the boundary. So um, in topological space, you can have, it's defined based on the open subsets. So the definition I'm, I have in mind for the topological space is based on the open subsets. And so I think you're associating density matrices on each open subset of the topological space. So my question is what, what, what's going on with the boundary of these regions? Um, okay, I think maybe I should say so. There, there is a there's an important buffer between us and the true horrors of the point set topology, okay. which is that I, everywhere I'm imagining that really I'm talking about some lattice model, okay. and with a correlation length that's that's short compared to the sizes of the pictures that I'm drawing. Okay. Um, so so you know if you if you zoomed in on one of these pictures, I want you to imagine you know there's some there is some lattice in there. Which okay. provides a short distance cutoff, and uh, okay. and when you know the axioms that I'm imposing, uh, I'm imposing them only on 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 regions that are big. You know, let's just say bigger than the correlation length. Okay, okay, okay. I see, I see. Yeah. So, for example, I, I wouldn't let you make a region which was really like had like a boundary which was really zigzagged. Mm -hmm. um, that's 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 cheating. That's not allowed. Okay, okay, okay. Um, so maybe I, I think maybe that this is related. So actually, maybe there's one other thing that's related to what you're saying, which is that in the definition of the information convex set, um, we actually extend the region a little bit and actually demand overlap on balls in the extended region. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I see. So I think that that takes care of you know any possible disagreement at the boundary. Okay, okay, okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So, 
Well, exactly that point. I didn't quite get the intuition of what this extension slight thickening is here in this example. Yeah, I think it's it's exactly related to this question about what happens at the boundary. So, you know, we don't we, we want balls that are completely contained in the extension. So, um, uh, if we demanded only balls that were completely contained in the region itself, then there could be disagreements on the boundary, and we don't want to allow that. Yeah, I see. I see. Yeah. So it's it, it's just just to avoid avoid that kind of issue. So I think me, I think that's that's my best answer to your question of what happens at the boundary. We sort of make it a little bigger and then retreat. So if I'm allowed to use this word, um, so you're actually doing a completion for this set. So you're including all the sets that is near neighborhood of the points on the boundary, right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Complete. Yeah, maybe that's the right word. Uh, what one? more question i have is that uh so in this three-dimensional example also are you thinking of um uh, still we're going to be computing entanglement entropies and we're going to like be looking at entanglement entropy differences or are there more sophisticated measures that will come up ah ah okay um Well, yeah, I, it's maybe maybe it's a little surprising that that there's been so much success of a program that uses you know involving mixed states that only talks about Nova Neumann entropies. Um, yeah, you might be surprised by that. Um, indeed, we haven't we haven't had to think about uh, more subtle uh, mi mix, mixed mixed state entanglement measures, um, which I, I won't say that they're not useful, but. Uh, yeah, we haven't had to do have had to think about that. Um, Thank you. And why is that? Yeah, that's surprising to me. But maybe maybe it's just because the axioms uh, restrict the set of states that are involved, right? So so in particular, you know, one thing you might notice is that the axioms forbid volume law states, right? So the you know the volumes yeah. of these regions don't cancel in the axioms. Um, so that's you know. Um, so it'll be hard to extend this to a theory of, of excited states. Um, uh, I think I think that might be that might be the reason that uh, it's difficult to have correlations other than quantum correlations in such states. Um, Thank you. Any other questions for John? The last question. If not, let's thank Sri here again. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sure. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So it was great. Uh, it was great. Thank you so much. We'll post this on YouTube. Okay. <laughs> All right. Cool. Have a wonderful day. Okay. Take care. You too.